Hebrews 2. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and all deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he, he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Well, if you have your Bibles before you, phones, uh, whatever means, turn to uh, Luke's Gospel. Uh, We've been working our way the last six weeks uh, through this section we're going to call the Year of the Lord's Favour, this first section of of Luke's Gospel. And um, today we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 6 and, sorry, chapter 5. And we're going to be reading from verse 17 all the way through to verse 26. And this is a section, uh, it's a really well-known story. It's in each of the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark and Luke. And it's, it's a story of these blokes with really strong faith who sort of uh, break through a roof to, to bring their friend to Jesus. So we're going to hear from God's word. It it's also starts a section in Luke's gospel where Jesus faces opposition. Where people, uh, where the Pharisees start gathering and are concerned about his teaching, they're concerned about who he associates with and what he is doing, and so Luke introduces us to this section now. So let's hear God's word, uh, reading from Luke five verse seventeen. This is the word of God. On one of those days, as he was teaching. Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But Finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Rise Pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. 
And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Well, indeed they had. Let's pray and then we'll hear from God's word. Father, we, we thank you for Scripture. We thank you that it is indeed the very words of God, sharper than any double-edged sword, and we know that it is, it is powerful to achieve all of your purposes in and amongst us. Oh, so how we pray your word would conform us into that image and likeness of your Son, and if there is any amongst us who do not believe that, our Father, you would grant them no rest and no peace until they find it in Jesus. To this end, we would pray, use the weakness of the flesh, the folly of preaching, to bring glory to your Son and to build up your church, because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, exotic cars, just generally speaking, don't particularly interest me. Um, but when a, in a car, the kids go nuts whenever they see exotic cars. You know, Ferrari, McLaren, uh, Lamborghini, and the kids are all bagging as if somehow they can magically own these cars. In fact, pretty much any sports car, when we would travel in the car together with all the kids, they'd all bag them. And I'm like, Pfft. What a waste of money. What a bunch of posers. But if I saw like an old school Land Rover, I mean, I'm thinking, wow, what, what a thing of beauty. What a, what, 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 how breathtaking. I mean, what a wise and good an investment that would be. Maybe you're a little bit like that. Maybe there are some things that really get your attention. Um, I mean, I don't know what it is. We're all, we're all wired a little bit differently. But maybe it's a, a beauty of a home. Um, maybe it's a garden. Maybe, maybe it's art pictures. Maybe you're into horticulture. They're the sort of things that would get your attention, the sort of things where you see beauty interwoven in them. Uh, maybe you're a person of, let's say, less refined tastes, uh, and your head gets turned by land cruisers, or 22 bolt action Winchesters. And that's just half the women in the congregation. Uh, you know, where weekends away uh, that, that, that are exotic and fun is camping and hunting. That's a thing of beauty. Now, I'm pretty sure I know what turns most of the bearded ones' heads. And I'm pretty sure I know what turns my wife's heads. And frankly, it's not me. But let me tell you with absolute surety what turns God's head. Faith. Faith turns God's head every single time. Faith gets his attention. Faith is actually ordained to achieve his eternal purposes in this world. And that is what is front and center in our text this morning. In fact, this is the first time Luke mentions faith in the gospel. And it's the faith of four friends that, that, that actually moves Jesus, compels Jesus to heal their paralyzed friend. It's the faith of four mates that, that bring Jesus actually into conflict with the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law. It's the faith of these four friends that is going to reveal the fulfillment and the end of the Mosaic era, the old covenant that is going to bring Jesus into so much conflict with the Pharisees. And it's a faith of these four friends that will challenge us today to ask the question, and what do we do? What are we doing to bring our family and our friends and our workmates who cannot bring themselves to God, what are we doing to bring them before his throne? And so in verse 17, we're just told about a certain day. It's a certain day when Jesus is teaching. And verse 17 says, The Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, note that, sitting there. And more than that, notice what, what Luke wants us to know. They'd come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. 
Now, the two things of great interest here is that, that Jesus is creating such a commotion that theologians from every single town have all come to hear. In fact, even representatives from the Jerusalem Theological College, they're there and they're listening and they're waiting and they're evaluating everything he says. They're hanging on his words. That's the first thing. Jesus is shaking everything up and that everyone who is a mover and shaker in religion is there the day to hear him. And here's the second thing. Notice that they are sitting. That is, they're not his students. They're not his disciples. They're not there to learn. They are sitting because, like him, they're teachers. In Jesus' day, the rabbis sat, the students stood. And so the Pharisees and scribes, they're making a point. We're his equal. We too are teachers of the law of Israel. And so they sit near him as he sits. No doubt in their minds sitting over him. And the crowd are standing, absorbing all that he's teaching. And Luke wants us to know that on this certain day, when all the theologians were present, the power of the Lord is with Jesus to heal powerfully. Look at verse 18. And behold, some men bringing on a bed, a man who was paralyzed, tells you that the intention is to seek to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in. Because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. Now, I don't have to, you already know this is so obvious, this story. This is a rip-roaring story. When this would have been told and told and retold with great hilarity. We've heard it so often, we sort of forget how literally hilarious and outrageous it is. The blokes want to see Jesus and they rip a hole through a roof in the middle of the lecture while everyone who is someone in Israel is present. And these blokes don't care. The only thing they care about is their mate. It's outrageous. It's cheeky. It's a story about determination and faith. And so Mark wants us to know about these four blokes, four friends, who've got a mate who is paralyzed. And we don't know how or when. We don't know if he was born like that or he's just some numpty who stacked his snowboard. We don't know if he's 52 or 22. But we know he's got four good mates. And they believe that Jesus could heal him. And so they were convinced, if we could just get to one of those lectures, we could just get him close to Jesus. I'm telling you, I've seen it before. This guy just says the word and the blind see and the, the, the deaf hear. And, and I, look, I've heard friends say, the paralyzed guy, he just walked. I'm telling you, we just, we just got to get him close. And so that's their plan. But, you know, it's, it, it's a bit hard lugging a 90 kilo bloke around the streets of Jerusalem. When they get there, some bloke in his land cruiser has parked in the disabled space. Great. So as they head around the side to the disability ramp, there's a bunch of heavily bearded blokes there too. The place is just chock a block. And they just can't get in. Every door, every doorway, every space is filled. And it must have been so frustrating. It was a great plan. We, we got this close, but, you know, sort of not quite close enough. But these blokes are nothing if they're not determined. As Jesus was speaking, some of the people in the front row start sort of walking up. Is that, is that dirt falling from the roof? And all of a sudden, daylight literally just beams through the roof. And then like a bunch of SAS paratroopers 
The four friends let down the robes and lowered their friend to the ground, literally at Jesus' feet. And no matter how you frame this narrative, it is outrageous faith. And the text says, and when he, Jesus, saw their faith, not their mess, not, their, not the unplanned interruption to his lecture, but when he saw their faith, and when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins have forgiven you. Hold on. The four friends all looking at each other sort of, what did he just say? We come for healing, not forgiveness. It almost listened to them, sort of trying to work it out in their minds and the whispering on the roof. You couldn't hear him. What did he? He said, "You're forgiven." We didn't bring him here for forgiveness. We brought him here for healing. You can almost imagine it's a tad disappointing, sort of like you know you plan to to go hear John Piper and you get Darren Middleton. It's an anticlimax. And here is Jesus offering forgiveness. Maybe the only upside is maybe that might include the repair bill on the roof. But it wasn't just the friends who were taken by surprise by Jesus' words. Verse 22 tells us, so were all the theologians. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive God? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, I've got to say, this is, this is where the text is often misunderstood. The normal understanding of this, and probably at one time I probably would have agreed with that, is that the way it's read is that the blasphemy is Jesus is claiming to be God because he's, he's forgiving sins. I'm going to make a big deal of it, but I do want to point out this. Um, I don't think that's what's going on in the text. What the Pharisees, the scribes, what the theologians of the day found blasphemous, that Jesus is offering forgiveness outside of the Mosaic law, outside of the Levitical priesthood, the Levitical sacrificial system. It's outrageous. You can't do that. Who is Jesus to do that? Is Jesus descended from the tribe of Levi? Is he a priest? I mean, for 1,300 years, the only way of forgiveness in Israel was through the sacrifices and the priests. And, and, and don't forget, Yahweh instituted this. This is Old Testament law. Forgiveness through Levitical priesthood and sacrifices. And therefore, Jesus is not authorized to forgive sins under the Mosaic Covenant. That's what was blasphemous. Jesus is literally overthrowing the whole sacrificial system that was set up by God himself. And they found that blasphemous. And the text says, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man, remember that's an Old Testament term of the Messiah, the promised one who would come to fulfill the Old Covenant. But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, because that's what he's doing outside of the Levitical system. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. In other words, what he's saying is, I will show you that God has given me authority to forgive sins outside of the sacrificial Levitical system because I will show and display the power of God when I say to this man, pick up your mat and walk. I will show you that I am the Son of Man of which the Old Testament spoke. I will show you I am the promised Messiah who would come and fulfill the Old Covenant and usher in the New Covenant, the great High Priest who would make a propitiation for the sins of his people, Hebrews 2, 17. And no longer had Jesus spoken to them. And the text says, and immediately, the words just brought it into being. 
the man rose up before them, picked up what he'd been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. <laughs> Again, we've read the stuff a thousand times. Oh yeah, there was a paralyzed guy and he just picked up his mountain wall. But you imagine that. Imagine being there and amazement seized them. And they're filled with awe because we have seen extraordinary things today. And indeed they had. They saw the beginning of the end of the old covenant. They saw the beginning of the ministry of the great high priest. They saw the one who was anointed display his authority to forgive and heal. And they saw the amazing faith of four friends. Indeed, they witnessed extraordinary things that day. So what should we do with the text? Well, here's the first thing to do with the text. The main point of the text is clearly, this is the beginning of the end of the Levitical sacrificial system. Don't miss it, it's huge. It's a bombshell on Israel. It's a bombshell on the disciples. And you know it's a bombshell because even when Jesus taught them this and explained to them that he'd have to go to the cross, that he'd have to be a high priest, that he'd have to make a sacrifice to himself, when he went to Jerusalem, they tried to stop him. When they nailed him on the cross, they deserted him. When he was dead, buried and raised, they still couldn't get it. It was a bombshell. And remember, for 1,300 consecutive years, only blood sacrifice and Levitical priesthood could bring you forgiveness. And you would trudge up that hill all the way to the temple. And you brought your sacrifices with, them, with you or you bought them at the temple at a premium. And you would hold your breath as the priest took your sacrifice and inspected it. And then you would go home relieved when finally you heard those words of forgiveness. And then you'd have to go and do the whole thing again and again and again. And at some point, every Jew must have thought, oh, that our sins just might be taken away once for all. Every Jew understood. They're not silly. They know that, that, that sacrificing a lamb or a pigeon or a goat, that, that the shedding of an animal's blood, that, that it didn't literally take away their sin, but it pointed to something. It pointed to a truth, that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood, and that one day, one day, the promise of the Old Testament is that the Son of Man, the day of the Messiah, the anointed one, that he would come and once and for all he would deal with sin. And Luke says that day they witnessed something extraordinary. Because the Messiah announced forgiveness outside of the Levitical system and it was a bombshell. And it was shocking and it was exciting and it was confusing. Listen, we live this side of Golgotha. We live this side of the New Covenant. We live this side of the cross, a grave, a resurrection, an ascension. This side of the New Testament. And we live this side of it with this complete and full assurance that it is finished. And we don't have to earn forgiveness. And we don't have to follow a bunch of rituals or rules to be forgiven. We don't have to punish ourselves for our sins. We don't have to suffer for our sins. We don't have to wait in our sins. And we certainly don't have to die in our sins. We simply have to trust Jesus and confess our sins. And I'll ask you again, have you done that? Are you doing that? Youth group, all, all the kids in the youth group, have you done that? Young children, we're sitting there in the catechism. You, you heard about the kingdom coming because the king has come. Have you done that? Surely, adults, you've done that. Why, why, would, you, why would you lug around a rucksack of sin? Why, why would you, well, hopefully as if you're a woman, why would you hold on to a handbag of shame? Why, why would you somehow, like so many, kid yourself that with the passing of time, somehow my sin dissipates till it finally disappears. 
Why would you do that when you could indeed and should indeed confess your sins? Where Jesus offers just, not just forgiveness but restoration. Burdens be lifted and guilt removed and shame can be traded freely for joy. What, what will you do? Seriously, what, what will you do with all your lies and deceit? What will you do with that? With your anger and your bitterness and your insecurity and your jealousy? What will you do with you know, your grumbling and your envy? You know, that blaming and complaining, that, the dissatisfaction and the bitterness. You know, the weaponizing of finances and sex and forgiveness that permeates every fallen home, every sinful home, every sinful person, every sinful relationship. You don't have to trudge up a hill to a temple. You don't have to come to church for forgiveness. You just simply come with empty, sin-stained hand and you plead Christ. Why wouldn't you do that? Even now. Don't miss that. And certainly don't neglect it. That is the main point of the text. The beginning of the end of the sacrificial system. Here's the second lesson for the text. It's not really about salvation. Can't even believe I'm saying that, but it's not really about salvation. It's really about the power of faith and how God uses faith to further his purposes in his world. The four friends, they actually came hoping for a healing, not for salvation. Now, I want to push this too far, and I'm happy to leave it as a bit of an open question, but it is a mistake to simply equate Jesus forgiving sin with eternal salvation. Let, let me explain. Sickness is not tethered to personal sin. If it was, we would all be desperately sick every single day. Now, in Jesus' day, many believed that certain sicknesses were tethered to sin. In fact, James 5, when he, when, when he writes to the church, he says that when we're sick, we should consider repentance because our sin might be the reason we're sick. I'm not saying it is, but it could be. Call the elders. Get anointed with oil. Confess your sin to one another. Because it is actually true that some sickness is a temporal judgment of God upon us. And it can be rooted in sin. And so it's always worth considering, do I need to confess? But the main point is that faith is actually powerful and used by God. That's why James says in 5.13, the prayer of a righteous man has great power as to its working. Why 1 Peter 3.12 says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are actually open to their prayers, their, their prayers of faith. Remember uh, Abraham, Genesis 18.12, when, when the Lord uh, comes before him and he says, you know, should we tell Abraham about what's happening at Sodom? Yeah, well, let's tell him. And Abraham's shocked. You, you, you're going to smite a whole city? And he says to him, what, what, what if there was 50 righteous? Would you still judge that city? Well, it goes, no. And then he just you know, runs through the numbers. 20? Would, would, would you, if there was 20 righteous, would you, would you still smite Sodom? And God says, no. I would spare it due to the righteous. And, and again, what he's saying is that, that, that the prayers and the presence of the righteous have a common grace blessing, even on Sodom. But there comes a time that places like Sodom have run out of their capital and their blessing and judgment comes. It is true that, that non-Christians, family, friends, even cities and nations can live off the spiritual capital of the church whether it's because of Christian schools, hospitals, mercy ministries, because of our lives as witnesses of salt and light, because of uh, active prayer and intercession for cities and workplaces, family and friends, there is actually a biblical truth that God's blessings and mercies, both temporal and eternal, are sovereignly worked out through the faith and prayers of his people. Remember the centurion's faith? We'll get to it in 
about six weeks. But in the centurion's faith in Luke 7, the centurion's faith heals the serpent. The serpent doesn't have faith. His master has faith. And, and Jesus told about it. So, and, and moreover, the centurion is a Gentile, a Roman of all. And Jesus comes to meet him. He says, whoa, whoa, you don't have to come any closer. Well, I'll, I hear that your servant needs to be healed. I'll come. No, you, you don't need to. He says, look, I'm a boss. I know what it is to, 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 to tell people, go here, go there. You're the king. I, I get it. You just say the word. You don't have to come any closer. You say the word. He'll be healed. I know that. And the text says Jesus marveled. He marveled at the centurion's faith. And he said he had not seen faith like that even in Israel. And so the servant, the centurion's servant, profited and was healed because of his master's faith. And so is this paralytic in the text. He has profited because of the faith of his four friends. And so I want to leave you with this thought this morning. Who's profiting from your faith? Who is being blessed by your prayers? Whom are you bringing before Jesus because they cannot bring themselves because of sin or unbelief paralyzes them spiritually? Who are you bringing before the King of Kings? Now, I'm assuming your kids benefit from your prayers. I'm assuming your family benefit, right? You pray for your family because you love that. Well, guess what? Even the Gentiles do that for their families because they also love their families. And we would go to amazing lengths to see our loved ones healed or forgiven, right? But what lengths will we go to for our friends and acquaintances and workmates whom God has placed in the orbit of our prayer life? What lengths would we go to for the city in which God has placed us to be light and salt? How, through prayer and faith, are you currently loving your neighbour? You're bringing your neighbour who is paralysed in sin and unbelief, cannot come to Jesus unless you carry them there in prayer. And how creative are you? I mean, the roof is an option, right? Maybe not this roof. The board, don't mess with this board. But how persistent are you? You wouldn't easily stop praying, would you, just because you run into some obstacles? Surely, surely the faith of these four blokes challenges you, at least there. And how urgent are you? I mean, Jesus really is, I mean, you believe this, that Jesus really is the only hope. The only hope. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. Father, oh, give us a faith so strong, a faith outrageous, a faith that causes people to marvel, a faith that works, a faith that prays, a faith that serves, a faith that is not easily discouraged, a faith that is creative, persistent, urgent because we truly believe that there is no hope for our families or our friends or our city or our nation or this world outside of Christ and we know that for both temporal and eternal blessings you have placed us on this earth to be salt and light a city on a hill because no one puts a light under a basket Oh, help our faith and prayers to shine brightly. Stir our hearts so that we might be men and women and boys and girls who are actively praying and seeking to bring people before the King of Kings, not just those who are close and those whom we love, but our neighbours, our workmates, and everyone who you bring into our sphere of influence, that you, through us, might do your work of blessing and grace. And so, Lord, we commend ourselves to you even now. For we ask all these things, including the forgiveness of our sins, the strengthening of our faith, 
and the enlivening of our prayer life because we ask it all for the Jesus' name and for his sake and glory. Amen.